Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of BTV. We are here with the one and only Robin Arzon. You got is, it. is that right? Yeah, you got it. Boom. You got it. Boom. <laughs> So, Robin is a superstar, New York Times bestselling author, personality, influencer, amazing woman all across the board. Uh, we reached out to you on Instagram. Thank you for the, accepting the invitation to come <laughs> onto the show. You really make me feel lazy, and that is like that is an incredible thing. So thank you for that, Robin. Before we get into your story, I just want to thank Facebook Live for watching. I want to thank yes. our amazing team for doing the transcription, for doing the video, for doing the video, for doing the Facebook Live, and for you sharing your goodness with all of these amazing people that are watching. Thank you for all of you that are watching as well. Robin, before we get into what it takes to become a New York Times bestseller, what it takes to run five consecutive marathons in five consecutive <laughs> days, and more importantly, what it takes to run 100 miles at once. Was that all at once? Yeah. 29 hours. <sighs> it's so crazy when I... I'm done. It's so I crazy. Go. <laughs> <laughs> Before we talk about all those things, tell us a little bit about who you are, where you come from, and what was the driver behind this life of yours? Well, I didn't run my first mile until I was in law school. I actually was a practicing lawyer for seven years in New York City, and I... Um, I actually loved it. I thought I loved the part. What kind of law did you do? I was a corporate litigator, and okay. then I dabbled in a little bit of IP as well. This was during subprime, like the markets were crazy. It was a really stressful time, I think, to yeah. work in anything related to finance, but I kind of liked that friction. I, yeah. Even though, frankly, the, like the SEC regulations and other subjects were mundane, I loved the intellectual rigor of the job. But I did find myself um, counting down the hours until I could leave the office and run, even if it was like at 10 p.m. for 30 minutes. And the was that the first time? So you're was this the first time that you were like, oh, there might be something here? Yes, and I didn't run my first mile until I was in law school, and that was actually to deal with a traumatic hostage incident that happened yes. to me when I was in college in the East Village. In the East Village, yes. yeah. So I was. In my senior, entering my senior year at NYU, and um, I was held hostage by a man with a gun in a wine bar in the East Village. Totally random, um, and Crazy. that obviously traumatic experience kind of, um, I think, set a different trajectory for me because I felt like I needed to move through the trauma yep. in ways that traditional therapy and things didn't accomplish, yep. and the running my first mile and then my first 10k and then signing up for my first marathon and then I just kind of continuously raised the bar and my running and law kind of went in parallel tracks until I just ran right out of a law career so I started <laughs> increasing my distances increasing you know decreasing my pace and here we are <laughs> so all right so so the the when you were held as a hostage in the East Village which you know, for, for all of all of our friends in Las Vegas, like this is obviously a very timely topic. It's scary what's happening um, in, in many parts of the world. But was that the, was that like, did you, when did running come into your mind during that process? Were you like, oh my God, I'm hostage. All I want to do is like run? No. Or like, it, what happened? It actually happened, I would say like, it marinated probably for like a year. I I, ne I literally didn't run my first mile until law school. Mm -hmm. I was I joked that I was allergic to fitness. I like would forge notes to get out of gym class. Sorry, mom. Um, and it really wasn't part of my story. Sorry, like mom. it really it, I I was intimidated honestly by considering myself an athlete. Why, and why do you think that was? It's just not something that I ever did. I was the arts and crafts kid. I yeah. was the kid that got straight A's. Yeah. And of course there are many people who do all of that at once and excel in sports, but that's not something that I even allowed to enter my yep. mind. Yep. Um, and I do believe that I, I just didn't identify really with, with any of the public figures at the time. You know, it was like the Chicago Bulls and Michael Jordan and, you know, you know, there were female athletes around, but it wasn't really part of the conversation, at least not one that I was part were of. Were you born and raised in New York? I was 
born in Philadelphia and raised outside of Philadelphia. Okay. And then at what point did you come to New York? For law school? I came, no, for, uh, to attend NYU, so for college. For college, okay. Now, the, the running starts, and you're starting to feel this, at what point did you say, this is actually what I want to become my thing, my full-time job, my world? Well, that really, that really came about with influencer marketing. It was, you know, these platforms are mushroom, platforms are mushroom, mushrooming, and brands are paying money to people on the internet and on apps for things. And honestly, things changed when I stopped accepting free shoes. Hmm. It was like I'm not accepting free shoes. You're paying my rent, and huh. that's when things changed. Cool. So, what was the first "you're paying my rent" thing that came to you? The it was, but it was. Really, like twofold. I was talent on camera, you know, yeah. just in an ad campaign or things like that. And behind the scenes, this was much more interesting for me. I had a lot of consulting gigs. So okay. I just started charging brands an hourly rate to consult for the meet for coffee, pick your brain. I was like, sure, we can do that. And this is my hourly rate for that. And what did they want to meet with you about? Usually it was about like, this was. I guess considered the third wave of running five, six years ago, really getting to the urban athlete, maybe the person who wouldn't consider themselves a casual jogger, but also isn't a marathoner. So running is now a lifestyle for a lot of 20 somethings, 30 somethings. Yeah. And this was really that tipping point. Yeah. And I was running with a crew, the original New York city run crew bridge runners. And that was very robust and dynamic and organic. And then brands started piping up like, Oh wow, like, you guys might be onto something here. Okay, so so a lot of people want to know how to become an Instagram influencer. A lot of people think, you know, there, there's I am I am shocked at how many people think this thing happens just like quickly. That's so insane, <laughs> right? So tell us about the process of like when you started producing content, creating content around this running lifestyle, and how long did you create content before you started to see these opportunities come to you? So I started a Tumblr. Literally just as a scrapbook for me for my own first marathon journey. I yep. signed up for the New York City Marathon after a breakup, yep. um, and I just wanted to document that. A little less process. dramatic than a hostage. <laughs> I mean, well, well, maybe I don't know. Maybe not. <laughs> it was very much so less dramatic. Um, everything, everything is in context, man. But it yeah. it became. Um, just something that I started doing. It's like I'd go for a 20 miler and I'd capture that. And it really was just so I could look back and I didn't know if I was gonna be one and done, right? So I was yeah. like, if I'm only gonna run one marathon, yeah. I wanna be able to look back at 70 posts that make me proud. Yep. Um, then I so you did it for thing. yourself. I did it for myself. That's cool. And then um, I crossed that first marathon finish line and I was like, okay, I have the bug. Like this is about to become something yeah. for me. Yep. Um, nobody was paying attention. Nobody knew who I was for years, I mean years. And are you creating content throughout all of these years? Yeah. And, yeah. And the content, almost daily. The content is what? It's you. It's scenery. Like what is the content? So it initially, creating? Tumblr is more. Um, you know, it's a visual medium, but yeah. it's it, it was traditionally like more like a, a new platform for blogging. So yeah. I did toy with, uh, you know, sort of daily entries, more like diary entries. But then once Instagram hit. Um, it really became just a visual conversation, my visual conversation with the world, and it was through that platform that I realized, oh, like my point of view might be a little bit different. Like not everybody wears four finger rings to go run a marathon. Not everybody has like rib tattoos and wears red lips, you know? And I was like, oh, this is, this is cool. Like, and not only am I being accepted by the running community yeah. in real life, I'm now having virtual training partners around the world. And then I started going to races and visiting crews and people that I had only known on Instagram. And then things just started to grow. And it was like consistent posting, authentic messaging, real storytelling. Yeah. And I tell people like, people like, oh, how do you, how do you develop content? I'm like, if you are living the thing That's that you're cool. passionate about, yeah. you, are, you are never gonna have any, you're always gonna have the ability to post authentic and real content. Yes. That's cool. So then the, the transition into an influencer, right, was, happened at how many how many months or years in before you started to get people saying like hey we need you to do something for us um you know i really just i just inserted myself into the conversation like two weeks at the tipping point for me actually quitting my law job yep. was uh, the london olympics were coming up i had asked for an extension i took a five month leave of absence just to dabble in this world that was coming to an end the law firm was like, you're in or you're out. We love you, but you're in or you're out. Two weeks before the London Olympics, quit my job, went with a cracked iPhone, standing next to CBS and NBC, just trying to, 
elbowing my way to interview athletes and I was just posting stuff like just getting it out yep. there not even knowing who was paying attention yep. um, and then from there um, I ended up actually getting an agency gig working on the digit with Nike women's on the agency side so Nike women was my client and I worked with them um, on some of their platforms learned very very quickly that I didn't want to I wanted to collaborate with brands but I never wanted to be subsumed by their brand. So, Smart. and it was that, it was that point yep. that, you know, I think I had a mass maybe at that point, maybe like 7,000 followers on Instagram. Inter yeah. Interesting. Uh, but just enough to like be part of the conversation. Definitely not a seat at the table where, you know, things are happening, but I was bold enough and it was like that, it was that second jump off the cliff. Yep. It was actually less, it was more scary that second time. Mm -hmm. Leaving law, I was like, I'm sure. Leaving the agency gig into the ether of God knows what and just like really peddling for a paycheck, um, that was scarier. The second round was scarier. And how many have you had other rounds since then? Yeah. I mean, it's, 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 a, it's a circuitous process, but I mean, at this point, I, I mean, I'm very, very lucky that I have really established relationships with certain brands um, and. I, I actually you know, I have an agent at WME, so like things have really, cool. really developed a, a lot, a lot greater. So what other? So I know you're working with Equinox, and I saw a couple of other brands. What what other brands are you working with that you're really proud of? I don't. Well, this that's historically. So oh. I did work with Equinox. So that, so right now, um, I am a global ambassador for Adidas. Yep. I'm vice president and head instructor at Peloton, which is um, a cycling cool. company. Tell tell people what that is, because oh. I actually the first time that I was exposed to it was because of you. Oh, well, that's, yeah. well, welcome. Which welcome is really, to, which welcome is super to the cool. family. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's, a, it's an awesome, awesome concept. Yeah, well, Peloton is a technology company that produces fitness content. So we have a bike that people can, on which people can ride with us and live stream 14 to 16 hours of live content a day. Um, so I am one of the instructors. You, when you tune in, you see me on stage. You have metrics on your screen, so you and can it's be like a palatable. Party. It's, like it's a, a party, party, but it's also a really athletic experience. Yeah. Um, you know, you've got a leaderboard. You have, you are so accountable for your journey on the bike because it's, it really is all about you. It's 45 minutes for somebody to be selfish, and I think you leverage community and amazing, the best hardware, the best bike on the market. Um, with incredible software, boom, it's a wrap. And how did you get? Uh, how did you get involved with that? I um, so I entered group fitness honestly as a hobby. I was kind of lulled in between these influencer marketing gigs, which like there were months where I was just like, is this even gonna happen? So I was like, maybe I need a little something that's. What do you steady. mean is this even gonna happen? Well, because there would be, let's say, I'd get a modeling gig or a consulting gig, and that would be a few months. Yeah. But then I might go six weeks and nobody's biting, and I I'm see. pitching articles, and I'm doing. I mean, I was just wearing every hat, planting every seed, and it's only now that things are really starting to, to bloom. But there were months where I was like really second guessing myself. Yeah. So that so I entered group fitness. I'm obviously passionate about wellness, but I'd never really done it in an instruction as an instructor. Yeah. Uh, and I was teaching at a local studio in Union Square. I read an article in Fast Company about John Foley, the CEO of Peloton. Mm -hmm. And I was like, you know what? Like your vision is aligned. I want a global platform. I want to be with the best technology company in fitness. And here I am. And so what does that look like? What does your role with Peloton look like right now? So I'm vice president of fitness programming. So yep. I work hand in hand with the production team to develop all of our content offerings. I um, in, it, and I'm the lead for recruiting our instructors and kind of maintaining the roster of instructors that we have. When and I, looking, of course, I teach. Cool. When you're looking for instructors, because perhaps people out there that are watching this right now might be interested, what do what does an instructor need to qualify to be an instructor with you guys? Honestly, it's a really small bullseye. It's not just you yeah. know we have a lot. There are a uh, lot of figure. gorgeous fit people in the fitness community, but it's not just teaching um, a credible and authentic and athletic fitness experience. It's hosting a television show at yeah. the same time. So um, we actually have found in recruiting that it's usually word of mouth. We don't really host any open calls or anything like that, and it is a narrow bullseye. So I'm very very proud to say that I you know. I teach alongside the best instructors in the industry, and it's because it requires, frankly, so much more. When you have five cameras, you're dealing with a leaderboard of 600 people, including the 59 people in the room, a producer, you know, yeah. you know, flagging Lots you to let you know on. something. You've got messages flashing on your screen. 
Um, I'm proud to say that it, it's 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 tough, but it should be tough because we have a really high bar. What? So okay, now there are so many things to talk about with you, but like the what? At what point did you say I want to write a book? Where did the <laughs> book come in? So it's so funny to the hear book. like you yeah. really when you say like you're wearing all these hats, like you literally were wearing like a lot of different hats. Yes. The book you wrote, it then became a New York Times bestseller. Like, what was that process like? And what was it? You know, I know it's like it's. How did it happen? That process was accelerated almost by fate because I was um, joining a show with National Geographic called Migrations, where I trekked through the Serengeti. So I trekked through 200 miles of the Serengeti for National Geographic. I was leaving. I had just gotten a book agent. May, leaving to film the show in June. Yep. I give her the keys to the kingdom. I said, like, sign the deal, whatever the deal is, I'll take it. I come back in August after six weeks in the Serengeti, and she was like, you have until October 15th to write this book. <laughs> so it... <laughs> <laughs> She's like, Harper Collins just bought your book. You better write it now. <laughs> and so what, I literally only had three months. What did you pitch them? What was the pitch? The classic book proposal, 10, 12 pages. It was kind of a mix. You know, a lot of my book has... has visual imagery it has yes. imagery in it yes. so um, it was a mix of it was kind of my my Instagram plus five to eight thousand words right so ex sample chapters of course yep. um, market competitors table contents it's kind of like this a little bit of a fleshed out skeleton yep. but in this day and age it also involves the personality of the author because I think you know book publishers are realizing they're gonna get more um, sales if they're aligning with the personality. Sure. At and least in non nonfiction. Yeah. And so, okay, so you get you pitch Harper Collins, they say yes. Now you have six weeks to write a book or eight weeks to write a book. What was the, what was going through your mind at this point? Like if you if in this moment you if you thought to yourself, I want my book to do one thing, what was that thing? For me, it was to demystify running. There is so yeah. much technology and shoes and con it just stuff and it's like it's not that complicated lace up and decide how badly you want it and I think like it's it's just being and also it's not only unpacking running but also being unapologetic in your approach to running I think that there are so many different ways for people to feel really proud about towing towing the start line and I want and I want to, f to create a support system for that Interesting. And so, so then you write the book. What, if anything, did, how, how did that play into your brand? Like what, what changed for you after you had a published book? Uh, definitely more opportunities for things like speaking engagements, but from a community perspective, which is frankly more important to me, is actually just seeing how this, for some people it's, whether it's their first mile or their thousandth, seeing how my book can be part of their running journey, which is honestly in. It's insane. To and me. how do, how have you found most commonly that your book becomes a part of someone's running journey? Mm, oftentimes, it's somebody's first five k, somebody's first ten k, first marathon. And it's like I read your book. You helped me to just start. I just signed up for this race, I and I just it. did it. Um, and then, of course, I find really encouraging folks who were like, "Man, I rediscovered my love of running from this book. I haven't run in twenty years, or I'm rehabbing an injury, and yep. this is what I'm doing." And and that kind of aha moment that awakening yep. is like what running's all about and so you started you know first mile in law school and then you've run i mean when i when i read that you ran five consecutive marathons in five days <laughs> now mind you richard if you're watching my one of my best friends name is richard and he he loves he's running his fourth marathon this weekend in chicago nice good luck good That's luck awesome. richard and uh, I have uh, been, I've been to every one of his marathons so far. Uh, in fact, I surprised him in Berlin at the finish line. Oh, I just ran Berlin. You did? Mm -hmm. Last uh, September? No, or... last Sunday. Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> last Got week. It. Got it. <laughs> clearly, clearly, uh, I need to lay this up a little faster. So, but he, I see him after his run and he like, you know, is a zombie and he can't move. And then the next day there's like some soreness. Sorry, Richard, for putting you on a blast. But like, uh, you ran five marathons in five consecutive days. And you've also at one point run a hundred miles consecutively, correct? Right. That's correct. So how? <laughs> Seriously. Like um, how? What to are... be honest, training for an ultra marathon, which is a distance, any, anything farther than a marathon is... 
really just about back-to-back -back long runs. You add one extra long run a week. Of course, your weekly mileage will increase, but you know, to I don't want to bore you with the minutia of it. But in doing back-to-back -back long runs, and it is the mindset of a warrior. Like that's what attracts me to ultras, is that. Um, mm -hmm. There is no BS. You will see who you are at mile 70 of a 100 mile ultra marathon in a way that like, no, I mean, there's no, no therapist chair, no, no, no partner, no job could ever get you to that point. And um, that's how you have to want it bad enough. Do you have a, an, would you consider yourself to have an extreme personality? Yes. Yeah. So like what, um, I mean, so many questions about a hundred mile run. Let, let me just ask you a question that I that I selfishly want to know. What was like the craziest thought that you had during that one hundred mile run, where you were like, "Oh my God, I can't believe I just thought that." Um. So I ran. I was running point to point from Key Largo to Key West, and there's a seven mile bridge, and I was running just with a headlamp. It's probably midnight. Just me. There were no runners, no support, because there's no um, there were no shoulders on the road, so you couldn't ha even have like people meet you anywhere. And I was like, what if I just run off this bridge? Like, <laughs> what if I just run off this bridge? Like, into the wall? Like, just a really... Like, you wanted to or you were no, afraid No, just... Uh, like, I was afraid. Like, what Like okay. what if I just get so disoriented and I just yeah. veer off? Yeah. You know? And, uh, you're, you're, and what did you do? What, what was the next step? I just kept focusing on the light two, three feet in front of my... In front of me and just going towards it. Go, going towards the light. That's... Yeah, it was freaking insane. I mean, people do tend to hallucinate in ultramarathons. Yeah, I'm sure. Like, I, yeah. I hallucinate when I run, like, half a mile. Yeah. So, <laughs> it's uh... like an out-of-body experience. <laughs> uh, okay, so this is really cool. And then, the, in terms of... Going back to the book for a second... Were there any, because we have people that write and, and that watch the show, was there any, what, what tips would you give someone that either wants to write a book? So let's just do it in three parts. Number one, I want to write a book. What should I do to start? Number two, should I self-publish or should I go with a publisher? Mm -hmm. And then number three, how do I get to the point of becoming New York Times bestseller if I go with a publisher? Or if I self-publish, how can I really get it out there? Because I know a lot of people that write books and then, you know, no one reads them. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so let's start. We gotta write it first. For me, I actually found this writing the book proposal yeah. was really, really helpful. I mean, sometimes that might be putting the cart before the horse, but having a little bit of a skeleton to then flesh out yep. um, gave me guidance. So I literally carved out in my schedule, made calendar appointments with myself that it was like, this is chapter one, this is chapter two, and yep. maybe chapter one, and they're taking a little longer than I anticipated, or I'd blaze through, you know, 20 pages and. and not get up from my desk and t the calendar appointment was like a non-negotiable meeting with myself. So whether it was, and I tend to have them in 90 minutes of productivity. Okay. So I would schedule like three, four hours yep. and kind of not let myself up for 90 minutes, yep. take a breather and then revisit. So it was like three hours of real work and yep. like a four hour time span. But um, that calendar appointment, the consistency and having something in it to kind of keep you accountable, whether it's by chapter or topic or theme or whatever. Um, character, if it's a, it's a fiction, a fiction book. The second part of your question was so that's so it's great advice. Number one, if you want to write a book, just write a table of contents, even if it's loose. Number two, how did you choose between self-publishing and getting a, a publisher? I didn't actually have to make the choice. I actually really, it and then they got I was it, they really it. lucky to have. What have would a you? Publisher. What would you? Did you enjoy? I mean. Uh, did you enjoy that experience? If you were to do it again, would you have self-published or would you have gone with the publisher I, in retrospect? It was great. I mean, honestly, having an editor that's yeah. sort of aligned with you on your team, having the the team of HarperCollins like, and, have yeah, my back. I mean, it's a big... It's the best. It's a big... Yeah, it's sort of big, the best. It's a biggie. You know, so that's... No, no question about it. it so you were cool was, with the publication. The publication. Yeah. And then how... So how do you market the book? How did you personally market it? How helpful was Harper Collins in, in the marketing process? If you were to self-publish a book, let's say, what would you do now? I mean, you have a hundred and something follow, thousand followers on Instagram. What if you have five thousand followers? Well, this is where it was honestly so so part and parcel with social media is that I really told my existing community about it, and then of course Harper got it in many more stores and press started picking up. So that's yeah. where things kind of expanded. But my initial like pre-order was definitely just my existing followers and social leveraging social media like you would any other way. Yeah. I would say for someone with a smaller um, social media following, 
for anyone, frankly, is really just try to get it into the hands of people you respect and people who write about the things that your audience cares about. That's smart. So did you you have you had existing relationships with like with like bloggers yeah. and bloggers yeah. in the running and health and fitness space. Exactly. Okay. So next part of next question I want to ask you is do you ever get sick? Sick? Like yeah. ill? Yeah. Uh sure. Yeah. But not very often. Do you have you found that since you started running your immune system has built into or have you always been someone that didn't get sick very often? I well, it's funny because I, I was actually diagnosed as a type 1 diabetic right. about four years into my running. Um, so that was obviously came as a shock. My pancreas just doesn't produce insulin. But besides that very huge chronic condition, <laughs> um, I am actually in the best shape of my life. And I Yeah, I mean, you feel, look very strong. I am pretty strong. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah, I would I'm definitely strong. not mess with <laughs> I, I would I, I would definitely not mess with... I actually would try to fight Nick before I try... And Nick is pretty big. I would try to fight Nick before I try to fight you, for sure. It's, um, yeah, it feels good to be able to push and put, pull your own body weight. I always tell people, take up more space, man. Just take up more space. Like, the world needs you. Take up more space. I love that. Yeah. That and run towards the light. You're giving us, like, <laughs> I'm basically going to write an entire New York Times bestseller about this interview. So, um, then, okay, so type 1 diabetes is, so how, now, from a logistical standpoint, if you're running 100 miles, how does the diabetes play into that? Oh my God. I mean, it's so being a type one diabetic is like a tight rope, tight rope walk. Um, you are constantly negotiating how much insulin, too yeah. little insulin, how many carbs, what are you eating? And that's 24 hours a day. It's like having a child or a yeah. pet. You don't forget that that yeah. thing exists. Um, the, it is a huge layer on to in my, in my running. I mean, already you're very, the, the good thing about being an endurance athlete before I was diagnosed is that I was always very, very self-aware of how I'm eating, how I'm feeling, very in tune with my body. Yep. Um, and now I use that skill set to inform how I can run a hundred mile race when my blood sugar is dipping, when I'm going too high, when my, you know, I, I use technology, I use a pod that I had to rip that off during the Tokyo marathon because it, you know, it failed and it was alarming, you know, crazy things happen. But, um, I do same, same way I approach ultra marathons. I approach my type one management as opportunities to be stronger. Like every single day, I'm like, okay, you're even more of a badass because you just don't look yeah. this, this, and this, and yeah. people didn't even wake up yet. The, everything that you, everything you're saying is super impressive. Now, you're an early riser. I am not naturally. That's been just by having. Oh my over god! The years. Please tell me because I. I'm not. I'm no, not no, no. naturally. I'm Teach not. me because so, <laughs> like I, I really with all of my heart want to be an early riser, and I just, I it's so hard for me to get to bed before like seven thirty eight. Mm, so that's what, your natural clock. I mean, it is actually my natural clock is stay up until two, sleep till ten. Oh damn! Like I, I crank best from nine p eight p.m. to two a.m. Oh. But since we have a team and an office and all these things, I have to. No, like, I get it. It's not practical. How? Uh, what for all the people? And there's a lot of people out there that like say I'm a night owl, but I have to be in an office in the morning. What do you tell them? The number one way to develop a morning workout routine is to have an accountability partner. Like literally have somebody who's waiting for you at 6 a.m. or sign up for a class and you know the instructor or you paid money. It's like, why are you gonna yeah. waste your own money? A trainer, that kind yeah. of thing. It's like start with six weeks of like every Wednesday morning at 6 a.m. we do this thing. And that will at least get you out of bed and yeah. you will be tired initially, especially if you are like a more of a night owl. Yeah. But once you're realizing that you're feeling so much more productive and so much more energized throughout the day, um, you know, it's going to be worth getting to bed by getting yeah. that extra hour of sleep. Yeah. All right. So a couple of different philosophical questions for you. What drives you in your life right now? Um, I have a healthy fear of failure. I think that I, um, I establish really high bars for myself and I'm never satisfied. Yeah. And I think that you know, there is a champion mindset that, that that hunger always exists a little bit. Yep. And for me, like my biggest challenge, one of my biggest challenges is balancing feeling really content and pleased and proud yep. with like what the next finish line is. Yep. And I don't really, I live as if there is no finish line, but it's mm -hmm. like you should take a moment and marinate in what you did. So that balance is a little tough for me. And how um, do you, how do you strike it? How do you, uh, how do you handle that balance right now? Uh, do you have, I have any daily things built in? I do. Th I. I have like little gratitude moments. I set alarms on my phone to kind of remind me to like 
you know, little pithy things that kind of remind me to stay grounded. Um, and, you know, I have people in my life, my mom, my fiance, that are just like have really positive and really have that kind of like, I don't know, energetic frequency that kind of keeps yeah. me like neutral. Yeah. Okay. And then um, what are your next finish line goals right now? I've next got six a, months. If we sit down six months from now and you've said, I've done these things, it's been a good six months. What are those? What are these things? Well, from a racing perspective, I'm training for another 100 miler. I've got a few more marathons this fall. Always striving to I get love faster. It you, by the way, I've got a few more marathons this fall. Like, I love it how casual you are. Again, <laughs> one mile, I think I'm going to die. Like, die. Dead. But that's so relative. So bad. It really, it's I such need to, a... I need to, like, reread shift, shift that perspective, man. No, I know. It's true. <laughs> it's, so, it's true. All, all right, so you have a few where, more... Where, we're, we're talking about you right now. You have a few <laughs> more marathons to finish this fall. You're training for a 100 miler. Where's the 100 miler going to be? Back in the Keys. Yeah, back in the Keys. I'm going to revisit that same course, try to break 24 hours. Um, yeah, that's so, you know, we all, 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 all have to have goals. Just run for 23 hours straight. <laughs> yeah. Don't ever complain about working 10 hours a day, yeah. any of you. Yeah. Don't complain. So, <laughs> what else? Um, well, marathon. the Keep Building the Peloton team. I'm really excited about some initiatives that we have coming up. That's a full-time thing for you? Yeah, so that's full-time. I mean, I have like three full-time yeah. jobs. Um, what are the other ones? For me, it's... Adidas? Yeah, I would say like at modeling and things, that's kind of one bucket, which yep. includes Adidas. Um, then there's Peloton, and then there's my own... I actually, you know, I might not be winning races, but I consider myself a professional athlete, and I train 30 you hours think? a week. A professional, <laughs> I consider myself a professional athlete. I run 100... Yeah, I would say you're a professional um, So athlete. That those are the three buckets. It's kind of like my public-facing PR um, campaign stuff, Peloton, and then... Um, my own training. What's the big vision? 10 years from now, we're sitting here. I mean, if you have one. I, I yeah, I definitely like... have one. I, I really want to be known as someone who got people off the couch to do epic shit. And, I and that. I think every layer of my brand, whether it's associated with Peloton or Adidas or not, that's the core of my being. I so I will still be doing that in a decade. What's the thing that you're most proud of? about yourself? I am most proud that uh, I always get back up. Mm. You, like, I would sooner die than be defeated. Mm. Who's the most influential? I mean, can we do like five rapid totally. questions? Totally. Most influential person in your life right now? My mother. Why? She is a real life superhero. Why? One line. She is resilient as hell and I'm so glad I got her genetics. Yeah. All right. Um, Biggest frustration you have in your life right now? Diabetes, for sure. Best book that you've gifted to the most amount of people? Ooh. Aside from your own. Finding Ultra by Rich Roll. Okay. I've given that away a lot. And okay. Rich is a friend of mine, so hi, Rich. Cool. Hi, Rich. <laughs> um, the thing that you think you do better than anyone else? Get back up. It's a mindset. Mm -hmm. Um... The moment in your life that was the most impactful for you so far? Honestly, probably being held hostage because it was like okay. at a really young age and it, it gives you perspective like that. Like there's no, um, there's no misunderstanding of a purpose when you survive something like that. Like I was like, this is not my story. What is my story? Okay, let's go write that. And that's what happened. Cool. Uh, okay, so any final thoughts? That we'd like, I mean, first of all, Shut Up and Run, awesome. Definitely highly recommended. I actually need to, like, get into it. I started <laughs> to read it, and I was like, oh, my God, this is amazing. Santa loves it. Um, I need to get into it. So uh, Shut Up and Run, amazing. We'll, we'll link all of your social in the description. Um, what else would you like to share with people that are watching just about a message or a thing that you want, you know, to, to, to have the audience remember. Stop apologizing. Stop mm. apologizing for being new, for asking for attention, for asking for a meeting, for getting, you know, stop apologizing. It's like the, we live in a world of no, we live in a world of like, um, I think just this pervasive culture of no and limiting beliefs. So like stop apologizing for you, who you are, take up more space. And keep doing space. the damn thing. Take it more space. I love that. 
I love that. Take up more space. Keep keep looking for the light. Building. So, <laughs> last question for you. I, I keep saying last question, but it's like there's so many things I want to ask you. 103,000 followers on Instagram. Do you care about that? I absolutely pay attention to it. I mean, that I've been able to monetize that. How did you go from like, do you remember going from like 100 followers to like 1,000 to like 10,000? Like, what is the six, what is this, the recipe? Everyone wants to know how do I get a big following? How do I get a big following? How do I get a big following? What was your recipe for a big following on Instagram? Um, it was, it's, it's posting consistent content that people care about. And I do think that there is a natural growth from there. I planted so many seeds. I mean, it was like, and I didn't actually actively try to increase my following at all. It mm -hmm. really happened organically. Mm -hmm. Um, but you have to plant a lot of seeds. You have to like approach it on many different levels. So it's, it was approaching wellness, not just from following people that I respected, but it's also maybe engaging communities that like you could also be a leader. So it's like reaching high and reaching low and then and reaching to um, sort of people in the marketplace that you would consider your equals. That's from press, that's from networking, that's yep. you know, posting interesting stuff, commenting on people's things. It's like engage, like lean into it. Yeah. And it's not just all about like hashtag campaigns and like right. All this other like, it's actual that, work it's actual work if right. you don't approach it like a job yeah. minimally an hour a day yeah then you're just fooling yourself hour a day. wow yeah i would say it's an hour a day if you really want to increase your following it's minimum an hour a day yeah minimum right i was gonna say hour seems low so that i mean that's amazing so thank you so much for coming on the show this has been a lot of fun um we're gonna link up your social stuff i'm I mean, I'm not going to tell you I'm going to go out and run, but you definitely inspired me to go out and do cool shit. I hope you guys are inspired to get up off the couch and do cool shit. Thank you so much for coming in. It's been Thanks for pleasure. having me. Yeah. <clears throat> Have a great day. Guys, it's your hour. It's your life. It's your dream. Go get it. Because if you don't, nobody else will. <laughs> Thanks for watching, guys. Ciao.